So two women came before the wise King Solomon, dragging between them a man in a three-piece suit. This young CPA agreed to marry my daughter, said one of them. No, he agreed to marry my daughter, said the other. And so they haggled before the king until he demanded silence. My sword, bring me my biggest sword, said Solomon, and we shall hew the young man in half. Each of you shall receive a half. Fine, that sounds good to me, said the first one. But the other woman said, oh, sire, do not spill innocent blood. Let this other woman's daughter marry him. The wise king did not hesitate a moment. Indeed, the accountant must marry the first lady's daughter, he proclaimed. But his kings, the court said, but she was willing to have him hacked in two. Precisely, said King Solomon. That shows that she is the true mother-in-law. <laughs> For the past several weeks, we've been looking at Matthew 10, 16 through 17, and what it takes to survive as sheep among wolves. Jesus gave survival tactics for those who would follow after him, and at face value, they're not very appealing. He said, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd or wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. Throughout the corridors of time, the message of grace that the people of God have always proclaimed had resulted in rejection, pain, and countless deaths. The gospel is risky business. The grace of God is free, but the cost of being a disciple is costly. And going out on Jesus's kingdom mission Preaching a message of grace can be downright dangerous. For as many as can say a hearty amen to that truth, no one can complain that Jesus misrepresented the truth. He never hid it from them. He told them straight out, even before they had become the apostles, while they were still in their training period as disciples, he told them, this is exactly what's waiting for you. If you continue to follow me, it's never going to be easy. They're going to reject you. They rejected me. Don't think they're not going to reject you either. So he commissioned his first 12 to be the sent ones, to, get, to take the gospel of the kingdom to the towns and villages of their home country. Jesus told them exactly what waited ahead for them. And he told them to live wisely as serpents, yet harmless as doves. For people personally familiar with sheep, wolves, serpents, and doves. I think Jesus's parable statements here make a lot of sense. But for us, who've been uh, far removed from that animal kingdom, it kind of loses in the translation. So what I'd like to do this morning is try to make that metaphor a little bit more concrete. So how do all of us speak now? What vernacular do we carry this message in? And how should we face the onslaught of responses? Several weeks ago, I mentioned three principles to reflect upon if you're going to survive as sheep among wolves. I'm gonna give them to you again in summary. 
First, expect opposition. Don't be surprised by it. Expect it. Don't, don't say, oh, why is this happening? Jesus, it is going to happen. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to make sense. Just accept it. It's going to happen. Listen to what Peter tells his flock in 1 Peter 4.12. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials that have come upon you as though something strange was happening to you. Instead, listen to this. I love this. Catch this. Rejoice. Rejoice in those fiery trials that you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. In other words, when he returns. Therefore, expect it and don't allow it to overtake you. Second, keep opposition in perspective by being assured that God has a bigger picture in mind. Listen to the way Paul instructs his young disciple, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4.5. But you watch in all things. In other words, be vigilant. Keep your eyes open. Don't grow spiritually lazy. Don't become complacent. He says, basically, keep your eyes around, going back and forth. Watch in all these things. Listen what he says next. Suffer evil. In other words, allow yourself to go through these things. Do the work of one proclaiming the good news. Reveal the full assurance of who you represent. Therefore, we should look past opposition and not allow ourselves to be overtaken by it or overcome by it. Finally, Jesus instructs all who would dare to pick up their cross and follow after him to use opposition rather than run from it. We are to persevere through opposition. How? Here it is. By being as wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. That's a real big contradiction in terms when you think of it. Wise as the serpent, harmless as a dove, two extreme animals. And both ought to be personified in you and me. Not easy to do. So this morning, we're gonna expand upon these metaphors. First, Jesus declared to his disciples that he was sending them out as sheep. By now, we're familiar with the unique spiritual apostles that the, the spiritual power that the apostles had in delivering people from evil spirits, in healing people, all for the purpose, catch this, because we don't need this anymore. It's not common anymore at all all for the purpose of authenticating the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were not to take money with them. They were not to take goods with them. They were not to take any tools for protection with them. They were, not, they were instead being sent out by Jesus as sheep, not as lions, not as tigers, not as bears. Oh, my. They were not even able to take a sheepdog along with them to keep away those ravenous wolves when they slept at night. The power of the gospel has always been revolutionary at its core. It's the power of love and the offering of true freedom in Jesus Christ. It's nonviolent. Yet, Jesus says in Matthew 11, 12, that the violent take it by force. 
Now, the word violent that's used there has nothing to do with hostility. Instead, it has to do with those of us who have tasted it. You become consumed by it. And it becomes a part of you that when you taste it and you receive it, it's like you look at, I don't know if you like lobster. I love lobster. If you don't like lobster, maybe you like filet mignon. It's okay. I like filet mignon. Okay. Whatever you like, whatever is something that you is on the top of your list. If it was your last meal and you were a prisoner about to be put to death and they asked you, what do you want for your last meal? I don't even know if they do that anymore, but if they did, what would you ask for? I hope not a Big Mac. Okay. Well, after you've had that thing and you've tasted it, and then Charlie Baldini comes along and says, well, you're munching on that. Why are you stuffing yourself on that? I got some Wonder Bread for you. Thank you. I mean, I mean being realistic, you're gonna be like tasting that great stuff. You become consumed by it. And I give you the Wonder Bread and what do you say? So you just went, rightly so. Okay, Wonder Bread has what kind of taste? Makes you wonder. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's called that. <laughs> you see, you become, you hold on to it. You know what it's like? Think of a soldier conquering a country and then grabbing the belongings. What did I say? The, to the victor go what? the spoils, and you have those spoils in your hand and you're not letting them go because you fought for those things, they belong to you. That's what the passage is talking about. And when you taste the gospel, you become consumed by it and you will latch onto it. So therefore, here's the point of this, you think to yourself, okay, Charlie, you like lobsters, so we use me here and I've tasted lobster, and then I meet somebody who's been feasting on white bread all their life, and I say, hey, listen, this is what I've done. I've made a garlic butter sauce, and this lobster is amazing. It's steamed. Now, my mother used to make it much better than that sauce and baked and stuffed, but we're not going into that. But just the garlic butter sauce. Here, try this. You'll, your life will be changed. You'll never want to eat white bread again. You see, and that's how they felt when they received the gospel and they understood the freedom in Jesus Christ. The idea is, I want you to try lobster now. You gotta try, you that. You have to try lobster, you have to try filet mignon, you have to, whatever you like. But you have to try this, it's life changing. I must be hungry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you get my point, and that's how they felt. Surely everybody will want this. And then they go out and say, listen, this is great. This good news. What's the good news? Well, listen, we're all sinners. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And the good news is, this is this is unique to Christianity. The, of all of all the religions in the world, this is unique. God stepped out of heaven and actually saved us by sacrificing himself for us. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing, you can't work for it. You can't pay for it. You can't do anything. It's provided for you as a free gift. And yet surely you want this. It's free, it's yours. And then you're thinking people are gonna want this. And instead, you know, people say, ah, that's okay for you. And then the next thing is, leave me alone. If you pray your church and I'll pray in mine. You pray your deity, I'll pray to mine. And then, yeah, but 
don't you realize this is true? Eternity depends on us. And then you say, you know, you're a jerk. That's what happens next. See, it's rapture. I can't believe you believe that nonsense. And then you say, yeah, but it's not nonsense. It's changed my life. It changed. Listen, you're starting to get on my nerves. I don't want to hear this stuff. Enough. And then they try to quiet you down. And then you say, yeah, but I can't. I, can't. I care about you. I want to, I'm giving you a life. I'm giving you a life preserver. Grab it. Grab the life preserver. And the people, if you don't stop, I'm going to punch you. If you don't stop, I'm going to kill you. You see, that's how. And you're thinking to yourself, but I'm only trying to save you. I'm only trying to rescue. I don't mean that we save anybody. I mean rescue you. I'm trying to give you the life preserver. You see, and that's what Jesus is. They'll be surprised that they're not going to want this. And that's why it takes a miracle, a supernatural work, even to instigate that belief in anyone's hearts to where they finally start. Oh. But see, in Jesus's mind here, by sending us out, he knows that there are people most will reject, but there are people who will embrace. And hear this, every one of us, we all, by nature, started out as wolves. Before we became sheep, we were all wolves. None of us are born sheep. So therefore, Paul says, I do all I can if God will at least save one. My life was worth it. And that's the attitude Jesus is trying to get across here. So you're a sheep, I'm a sheep, you were once a wolf, you're no longer a wolf. Sheep become wolves become sheep by the grace of God. And that's great. Now, what about wolves? Well, wolves are pretty tough. I, I read some things about wolves, and it's pretty, it's pretty rough. Did you know that wolves, of course, we know that they are in packs. We know that. And they will attack anything. You see, even if they're not hungry, and I'm getting in trouble because I keep walking away. Bernie, you keep reminding me. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, wolves will kill even if they're not hungry. They will actually attack and keep their victim, their prey alive and hamstring. And if they decide they want a snack, you ever go to your refrigerator for a little snack, you're full, and then eh, I'm starting to feel a little empty here, and you go to your refrigerator. I've just been eat this little piece of cake. Well, wolves do that, except they keep as long as they can alive, and then they nibble off little by little, and the thing just has to stay there waiting. Wolves are tough. You want to hear something else about wolves that I didn't realize? Guess what a wolf's favorite part of an animal is? Can anybody guess? What? Well, hearts are really good. It's a good piece of meat. But no, the marrow of the bones. And in order to eat the marrow of the bones, guess what that means they have to do? Devour every last drop. And that's why the word devour is used. They devour the sheep, every last drop. And okay, so how would we, ways they devour you? Well, obviously people don't devour us anymore. I guess it used to be common practice in some cultures. 
But for the most part, I felt like I wish they had devoured me physically. Because it's painful what people can say to you. It's painful the way people can treat you. It doesn't make sense at times. You want it to make sense, but it doesn't. And sometimes you wish they had physically attacked you rather than emotionally. Jesus is saying wolves can have quite an impact on us. They could hurt us in many ways. And what the greatest way that a wolf wants you to be devoured, here it is. Simply put, they want you to stop being a sheep and go back to being a wolf. They want you to join the pack or rejoin the pack. That's all they want from you. Come back to the fold and they'll leave you alone. They won't bother you ever again. And then you could become one of the bullies bothering, don't you know Jesus died for your sins, yada, yada, yada. Well, let's get him. I used to be one of those. So Jesus said, there's a way to tell where you stand. In John 319, and this is the judgment because the light is come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light for their works are evil. What do you love? Where do you find your most deeper inward satisfactions? In things, in people, in power, in money, control. What do you love being a sheep? Do you love the good shepherd who laid down his life, the sheep? You see, these are things that I would never make a judgment on any of us. But that's something you have to do. So how do we, the sheep of Jesus's pasture, avoid being devoured by the wolves? Well, what did Jesus say to do in Matthew 10, 16? Be wise as serpents. A moment later, he stated the same idea in more concrete language because people will hand you over. Beware of them. Serpents are known for being crafty. Now, I got, I got to let you know, I've got a really good experience here. So I had this friend growing up named Jeff Podoff, okay? He was huge, this guy. And he was very meek. He was very mild. He was the quintessential Jewish mo mama's boy, okay? But he was a nice guy. And I took him fishing on the Schoharie River, upstate in Cobles, outside of Cobleskill. And I had a big raft two-person two raft, two-man raft. And we were fishing and nothing was biting that day. We were in a dam. We were like, there's, a, there's an electric power dam and we were fishing at the dam. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this black racer, you know, some snake, big, huge black snake. Mm -hmm. And I see it out of the corner of my eye and I'm fishing, we're talking, but I'm watching it. And it's, and it stop. And it would actually be in the bushes, in the water. And thought he was slithering by, you know, and I'm fishing with my friend. And all of a sudden it gets right 
about where the boat is. And I stick my hand in the water. I grab it by its neck and I throw it to Podov. Podov is big. He goes over the <laughs> into the water. The poor snake was freaked out. Podov was freaked out. I had a good time. It was boring. We weren't catching any fish. <laughs> but they're very crafty. They're very subtle. They will avoid you unless you're not that nice. <laughs> My wife, I got it. Leslie, I love you, but you want to hear what she's doing now? Do you remember uh, the Emperor Titus? Uh, he was Trajan's. But those of you, New Testament, did, did you read New Testament survey? Just thought it. Well, when you got to the Caesars, do you remember Trajan uh, 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 was the emperor and uh, he sent in his son Titus to go overthrow the Jews in Jerusalem. And that was in 70 AD. And when he came into the city they, in Rome, they had what's called a Roman triumph for him. And everybody was like, it was a big deal. It was ticket tape parade to the, to the tent extreme. And what would happen though is as he was coming in on his chariot, he had a servant behind him whispering in his ear. And the servant was saying, remember, you're only a man. Remember, you're only a man. That was his job to remind him that he's not a God, he's a man. Well, my wife, you know what she does? Remember, you're only a fool. <laughs> so she's good at whispering that in my ear. <laughs> um, they are very crafty, they're very subtle. And we're supposed to be like that. In other words, we're supposed to know what's good and what's evil. We're supposed to study these things. We're supposed to not fall into those things. Uh, we're not supposed to avoid being involved in the world of the worldly affairs, but we're supposed to be circumspect in how we do it and don't get caught up into it. Why? Discerning. And then harmless as doves. Well, what, what does that mean? Harmless as dove means that we are to be um, not fight, fight fire with fire. When, when the wolves attack, when they want to put you to death, when they want to strike at you, you don't say, okay, that's it. You've crossed the line now. Guess what? There is no line to cross if you're a believer. And that stinks because you want to think that there is a cause that you can fight back on. And Jesus says, no, sorry, abandon it. There's no cause, no cause but Christ. That's your cause. And that means your cause is to be harmless, not fight back. Let things go. Don't hold hostility in. Do you notice how, what a cancer that is? When you start dwelling on the wrong that somebody did, I gotta let you know, it's like a revolving door because so many people wrong you every day. So you get one that seems to be the wrongest of all wrongs and you focus on that one and it takes the focus off the lesser of wrongs and you start hating that person. And every time you see that person, it, they win you, they win over you, they win over your emotions, they win over your heart, they win over your intellect, they win over everything. And a lot of times they don't even care or they're not even aware that you feel this way. And they won. And then maybe things get right with that person, maybe that person moves, maybe that person fades away and there's 10 more waiting to take their place. It's an endless pit that will eat you up like a cancer. 
do not let it get you. See, and that's discernment coupled with innocence. That's how you do it. Not easy to do. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, the Christian must be guileless, innocent, genuine, without deception, and without harm. The 19th century pastor, Charles Simeon, by the way, you want to read a life that went through much adversity, read about Charles Simeon. I, I'm going to give you guys some good ideas if you ever want to try to shut me out. You, Sim, the advocate, those who were against Simeon, this is what they did. Members of his church, he was there for a long time too. Back then, they owned the pews, like they were family pews. So of course you gave money and that pew became the Baldini family pew. And you know, Bernie would not be able to sit there because it was for my family and there'd be a plaque on it because that was in memory of my family. And they actually, to make sure that if I wasn't there, that, you know, Bernie showed up and he wants to sit in my pew, they would actually lock it. And what happened was he, Simeon, started reaching all the young people at Oxford University, maybe in Cambridge, or I think it was Oxford in, in England. And he started reaching out to them and they started coming to church. And the people, the Baldinis will say, Made, made sure that their pews were locked so that those people would not be able to sit in their pews. And they just made his life miserable the whole time he was there. And I'm here 20 years. He was there way longer than that. He never left. He stayed there. Okay. But this is what Simeon said about this imagery, serpent and dove. The wisdom of the one and the harmlessness of the other are very desirable to be combined in the Christian character because it is by such a union that only the Christian will be able to cope successfully with his more powerful enemies. So we live on in, in, in two fronts. One front is spiritual, the other front is um, physical, but what it comes down to is Satan seeks to devour and destroy you. And his followers without knowing it will carry that out for him because you're different, because you're peculiar, because you're not cut of the same pattern anymore. You've been taken out of that. You've, you've been brought out of darkness, dragged out quite often into his wonderful light. Once you were not people of God, but now you are the people of God. That's People don't understand. If you're not that, then you don't understand it and you hate it. And you start feeling that people who have that, they feel they're much better. When in reality, if you do have it, you recognize you're much worse because you start seeing yourself as you really are and you see yourself as an object of grace. Nothing appealing about you but that God has shown grace to you through Jesus Christ. Well, um, so how do we deal with Satan and his followers? Wisely, get out of the way if you must. My, my uh, biblical theology professor, Dr. Van Groningen, 
He was huge. This guy was a Wisconsin, a Wisconsin farmer's son. His father was a slaughterer. He had cows. And this guy was, he had hands like this. He was Dutch. Dan Gronigan, obviously. Okay. What is that noise? It's upstairs. Are they speaking in tongues up there? <laughs> Can we fix that next yeah. time, please? Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Anyway, what, what happens is this. Um, he, he tells a story of he was young and his father took him out to watch him slaughter the first cow. His, you know, his experience of watching the first cow slaughtered. And he said, it was wild. My father, I'm using the term wild. He didn't say that. He was very smart, this guy, not me. Anyway, he says, my father brings out the cow. It was a big one. And his father was big like him. And he jumps on the cow and grabs it by its jaw. He takes this very sharp knife and cuts its throat. And all of a sudden, his father jumped out of the way. And he's saying to himself, what is my father doing? Why is he jumping out of the way like that? And the cow kicked his back legs up. That had his father stayed there, he would have been struck by that cow and killed himself. That's called a death row. And that cow, for all intents and purposes, had been slaughtered. Yet, he had that one last kick that if you got in its way, it would have taken you down with him. And he said, Satan is in his death row. He's already been defeated. The resurrection, the cross and the resurrection defeated Satan. He's done. He's doomed. It's over. But he's in its death row. And if you get in his way, guess what? He's going to hurt you. He's going to damage you. He's going to make you worthless, not effective. He's going to make you try to hate God. That's his greatest pleasure or desire. So let's, let's close this one last illustration. I don't know how many of you ever heard of the 40 martyrs of Sebastian. Uh, it's in Sicily, actually. Um, the, the Roman emperor at the time hated the idea of Christianity still. He was an old timer. He wanted the revival of the Greek gods or the Roman gods again, worship. Hated Christian. And he had some soldiers who were becoming Christians. And he saw his numbers changing. The people were becoming more sensitive. They were becoming God lovers right, and empower lovers. So what happens is he decides that he's going to give them an opportunity to recant and go back to the old worship of gods. And they said, no. So he takes, he has his soldiers take them out on this freezing lake naked. And they're out there in the middle of the lake and his soldiers are all warm around the fires. They're in, and he's, all you gotta do is walk away. All you got, and you could come out and join the fold again and we'll warm you, we'll feed you. And they're out there freezing, freezing, freezing. And all of a sudden, one of them, now don't forget, these were professing believers. They were young. One of them, a sheep goes back to being a wolf. And all the guards who are out there on the banks, heated up, enjoying life and having a good time, one of the wolves went out, took off his clothes, and joined them and replaced the 40 and become a sheep. What are you? Conflicted? Are you a wolf? Are you a sheep? I've noticed as time goes on, sheeps often go back to being wolves.
news. But I got better news. Wolves become sheep. Jesus offers you the gift of eternal life. He is the gift. He has laid down his life for you. What good is a man if he could profit and gain the whole world and lose his soul? Come to Jesus today. As we come together now, we have an opportunity to sit together at the table and enjoy the supper that he graciously feeds us with by laying down his own life for us. If that's your faith, if that's your hope, if Jesus is your savior, if you are consumed with Jesus, then this supper means something for you. If not, well, guess what? You're eating a cracker and look at this. Does be realistic. Look, everybody, does that look that desirable? <laughs> it's really not. I, I, I gotta say, I, I went to go visit Ben last week. Uh, uh, he, he was great. He, he, was, he, he spread a rumor around his family saying that I am no longer in the ministry <laughs> and that I was fixing cars. So I went up to see him. And, and he said to me, he goes, oh, so you're fixing cars? I said, no, no. I said, I'm still, I'm still doing this. And then we got to talking and, and he said, do you still cook? I said, yeah, I still cook. He goes, well, all they do is feed me chicken. He's close legs. All they give me is chicken, chicken, chicken. I said, well, let me ask you, if you had your choice of a meal, what would you eat? And he got real quiet and his eyes lit up. He's German, don't forget, right? You know what he said? Sauerbraten. So guess what he's getting today? He's getting sauerbraten. I'm bringing it to him. But you see, I'll buy you sauerbraten. <laughs> but this means something for us. This represents the blood shed for you, the body given for you. Let's go to the supper together and eat. <laughs>